In this video, I'm going to demonstrate the fundamentals of using Vapor 3.2. Vapor is basically a desktop application that is comprised of a series of uh, what we call renderers. And each renderer takes your uh, simulation data and applies color and opacity to it in unique ways that give effects that you can uh, create still images and animations from. Uh, this tutorial is going to be covering what I consider to be the most simple renderer in Vapor, and that, that's called the 2D Data Renderer. So um, before I get started, I'll just note that Vapor is free and open source. I'll put a link to our GitHub repository at the bottom of the video. Um, so you can download the source code, uh, compile it, and modify it, and even contribute if you like. But it's usually simpler for most users to download our installers for one of our supported operating systems. Right now we support Windows, OS X, Ubuntu, and CentOS. Uh, mostly modern releases, Windows 7, 10, uh, Ubuntu 16, 18, and CentOS 7. So with that being said, um, I'm going to get started with the first of our renderers in this video series, the simplest 2D data renderer. First thing I'm going to do is open up Vapor. I'm going to open Vapor through my command line since I'm uh, using a pre-release build from source right now. So I'm just typing Vapor from my, uh, my, my, my build directory. But if you install Vapor, you'll probably have an icon somewhere, like on, on Apple you'll have an applications directory. You'll have an icon that looks like this V right here. And um, you can click on that. That'll spin Vapor up as well. But um, my installer that I've installed is out of date. It's a little buggy. So I'm um, using a current build that, ha that is bug free. And let me, let me launch that again because I'm not sure <laughs> which one was which, which one had the bugs and which one didn't. So the current release that we have right now, bug free. Um, it's going to be more bug free before release. But now that I've opened it, we can see our vapor window. Everything is disabled. I can't, I can't press any buttons. Everything's grayed out. And that's because I haven't loaded any data yet. So the first thing I want to do is go to my file menu. And there are several ways to get your data into Vapor. Um, the simplest way is to directly import one of our supported data formats. Right now, we support WORF ARW, NetCDF files that follow the CF conventions. And we realize that a lot of uh, users' data does not follow CF conventions yet. Um, I'll have a video at some point talking about how to get your files to comply with the CF conventions, and it's, it's really not that hard. Um, but we have documentation on our website. I'll link that at the bottom and make a video later. And we also support impasse data. Um, the other type of data that you can import is called VDC, and that's Vapor's data format. And what that allows users to do is look at their data uh, at different levels of compression. The data I'm looking at right now is rather large. I have two time steps of Hurricane Harvey data. And that the size of that data can cause the renderings to take quite a while to appear on the screen. So if you want if you have a large set of data and you want an interactive experience, converting your data to VDC may be a good idea. That's what I did since this data is so big. So to get my data in, I'll go to File, Open VDC, and then I will browse to my Hurricane Harvey directory and open harvey.nc. Okay, first thing we see is a white bounding box that shows the domain that our data resides within. Um, I can control our perspective with the mouse. Left mouse button will rotate the scene. Right mouse button can zoom out by pulling back and zoom in by pushing forward. And the middle mouse button can traverse the scene. So those are the basic mouse controls, and here's our domain. Uh, but we're not seeing anything yet because we haven't created a renderer. So the first thing I'm going to do is click on this new button up here, and we'll get a dialog that shows all the different renderers that uh, Vapor currently supports. Uh, currently, we have Barb Renderer, uh, Contour Renderer, Flow, and Image Renderer, ISO Surfaces, our Model Renderer, Slices, 2D Data, Volume Rendering, and the Wireframe. Uh, again, I'll do a video and link to how to use all these guys at the bottom, but today I'm going to be doing the 2D data renderer. So I'll double click on that. And then we see our uh, control panel populate itself. Um, 
all of Vapor's renderers are controlled in somewhat the same way with this control panel. They all have at least four tabs, uh, those tabs being variables, where you pick what variable you're uh, rendering at the time, the appearance tab, which controls the color and opacity being applied to that renderer, geometry, which controls the extents of uh, the region that you're rendering. If you want to render a subset, you can uh, define that subset through the geometry tab, and then the annotation tab, where you can add a color bar. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna step through all the features in these tabs um, right now, I guess. So, variables tab uh, lets you select what variable you're rendering, but our renderer is not turned on, so we don't see anything yet. To turn it on, there's this checkbox over here um, under the enabled column. I can click that, and there is our first rendering of our current variable, uh, AC grid flux. I'm not sure exactly what that is, some kind of, a, I'm guessing, heat flux. Um, <clears throat> but basically, the variables tab will allow you to pick different variables. So if I want to look at, um, <clears throat> let's say, height, for example, we get a new rendering of that variable here. Now, different renderers will have different options under the variable selection tab. Some renderers just have one variable that you pick. Um, some renderers will have a series of variables. Uh, the 2D renderer only lists the two-dimensional variables in this data set. So um, there's, no, there's no Z dimension uh, prescribed in these variables. But what we can do is we can apply a height offset to our 2D rendering. If I, if I, if I go along the, um, if I make my view along the XY plane, you can see there's no Z dimension here. But I can apply a height variable by picking another variable. I'll offset height by height. And you know this is Harvey, so it's a pretty flat um, landmass. But we can see that we have offset a few of these mountains, I think, over here in Mexico by height. I'm going to pick a different variable. How about uh, albedo? Sure. Albedo. There's albedo offset by height. Below the variable selection, we have this data fidelity controller. And the data fidelity controller only applies to VDC data. So like I said earlier, uh, VDC allows you to look at different levels of compression in your data. And you can see down here, we have this controller for fidelity. Uh, low is on the left, high is on the right. And I can bump up the fidelity step by step until I can get all the way to the right, which is a perfect reconstruction of the data, no compression being apply, applied to the data set. But you can see my wheel is spinning. This is taking some time. And that's because this data set is 5 gigabytes per time step. Uh, this single variable is smaller than that. But you can see Vaver is really thinking right now about how, uh, well, basically it's just loading the data and applying the colors to it according to our settings. You can see the dimensionality of the variable uh, in these parentheses right now. So previously, I think we were at a 275 by 275 grid. As I crank it all the way up to a higher fidelity, um, gosh, I think this is going to be 1100 by 1100 um, on the x and the y axes. There we go. So we finally loaded our data, yeah, 1100 by 1100 on X and Y. We can really zoom in with our left mouse button and see the, the resolution of this uh, grid. Zoom back out. Um, but yeah, that's the basics of the variables tab. Pick a variable, pick a high variable for a 2D render. Next I'll go to the appearance tab. And this works basically the same way for uh, all the renderers in Vapor. Um, the appearance tab contains this thing in here we call it the transfer function. The transfer function is really the heart of Vapor. This is how you control what colors are being applied to your data values and what opacity is being applied to your data values. Basically how it works is uh, the transfer function will display a histogram that is a distribution of your data. Um, more, it's, it's just basically a probability density function. So the more uh, values you see on the y-axis, uh, it's just a tally of how many uh, values 
occur at that section. So if I go over here, I can see the bounds of my current transfer function. The minimum value is 0.08, the maximum is 0.267. I can modify the extents of my transfer function using these sliders. And basically what, what this is doing is it's taking the range of values for the variable. Um, on the left side we have the minimum, on the right side we have the maximum, which looks to be about 0.724. And it's applying color to these values according to where they lie in the histogram. So in other words, we, we see we have a bunch of values over here in this part of the histogram. Those are being applied blue and slowly fading into white. And then there are barely any, there are technically values over here on the right, but they're so few that they don't even register one pixel in the histogram. So those are being applied a red color. And if I zoom in, I, I wonder if I can find some of these. I don't know, let's see if I look really close. Okay, here are a few of our red pixels. And there's, there's just a few of them, so they're not even registering in the histogram. But what I can do is I can adjust, um, gosh, how, how this color is being applied in a few ways. I can reduce the maximum extent of the histogram, and so we're focusing in on these low values. What that's doing is it's dragging these low values out to the right. So those are getting applied more of a red color. And we can see more of the values that were previous blue, previously blue are now red. Um, so by controlling the extents of the histogram, I can in real time apply different color values um, to the different uh, data values. Another way to do this is um, to manipulate the color bar down here by uh, double clicking. Well, you can, you can click on these little knobs and these knobs have a single unchanging color that you can drag left and right. So if I take this guy and drag it right, I'm applying dark blue to all these histogram values that apply above it. I can also double click on the histogram and create, uh, or, I'm sorry, double click on the color bar and create a new color control point that has a single unchanging value and drag that to the right and left. And you can do that wherever you want. You can create as many as you want to get the desired effect and to uh, illustrate the observables in your data uh, the best you can. So that's how color works. Um, another thing uh, that the transfer function does is it applies opacity to your data. And that's done through this uh, horizontal bar we see here at the top. And basically what this horizontal bar is doing right now is it is applying complete opacity to all data values. Because it's all the way up here at the top, we are maximizing opacity. To reduce the opacity, or in other words, apply transparency, we can click on these control points and drag them down. And so what this is doing is it's causing a reduction in opacity to our histogram values that go down over here and then ramp back up over here and where this color control point, or where this opacity control point is all the way down, that is 100% transparent. There is these data values at this spike right here, they are not being shown, they are completely transparent. If I take this guy and bring it down, all values between this range are now completely transparent. And if I drag all the points down, everything will be transparent. I can also click in between opacity control points and drag them up like this. But I think you get the idea. Typically what a lot of people will do, it depends on the distribution of their data. If they have a Gaussian distribution, um, let's, let's pretend that this impulse right here, I'll, I'll zoom in on that impulse, and let's pretend it's a more or less, it might be a Gaussian distribution, but what people tend to do, what I tend to do at least, is um, mask out the, yeah, this might not be the best example, um, but with the Gaussian distribution, what you want to do is ramp up on the left and right um, in opacity to mask out the most populous values in your data. Let me see. I, I'm going I'm to change my variable. First, I'm going to go to the Variables tab, create my fidelity down because it's taken so long to load, and let's see. Um, what's a good variable? Is there a U10? Okay, well, let's go with the X component of wind at 10 meters off the ground. We're at the lowest fidelity, so it's... It's not going to be as resolved as previously, but here we have a better Gaussian distribution. What I'll do is I will mask out most of the values and ramp them up. 
so that um, only, only the high values at the extreme are being uh, illustrated. So that's typically uh, what you do with a Gaussian distribution. With a sequential distribution, like let's see, if there's a rain field, uh, rain C. Oh, it's uninitialized at this point. Let's see. Tall step one. Yeah, that's not a good example either. Let's see, I'll try one more and then uh, move on. Maybe temperature will be sequential. Or uh, somewhat sequential. What I'll do with, with this is, okay, I'll mask out all the values down here, and if I want to illustrate just the high values, I'll just ramp up on one side. But, um, I don't know. I'll do, I'll do another video on uh, color mapping and best practices later. I hope this is making sense for now. Meanwhile, I'm going to bring my opacity up and show some of the options in the transfer function. By clicking on this gear up here, I can control my color interpolation. Right now, we're using a diverging color map that has white space added to the middle. White space is very useful in diverging maps because it helps to distinguish the two extremes in your color map. You can turn it off if you like, but you can tell you can't see many of the oops, you can't see many of the features as well. So by adding white space, uh, Vapor has an algorithm that can tell if your two uh, ends of your diverging color map are saturated enough. It will add white space, and you can see your uh, features a lot better. Other options include uh, reversing the color map. You can swap the ends. You can save the color map. Uh, load one that you've uh, saved earlier. Like, let's see, I will load. Let me see if I can find one that I had. I think I called it ice. Uh, never mind. Let's see. But I guess the point is that if you um, have a color map and you have your color control points, let's say you have one there and you have one there, and you have a, you have a custom color map, you can save it and apply it to a different data set if you like. Additionally, you can load built-in color maps. So we supply all these different color maps, and these will be expanded upon in the future. Um, but these are the ones we have right now. You can just click on that and load different color maps that come pre-bundled with Vapor. Uh, other options include, did I talk about the interpolation? I think so. You can, I, I don't think I mentioned the color space interpolation, but um, there's the different color spaces that you can interpolate from. Um, you can save the transfer function, which is different than saving the color map. The transfer function uh, takes into account the bounds of your data. So if you want to save um, a color map for a, save, save a variable whose data values range between zero and one, you can save that color map and apply it to a different variable that has values that say range between 10 billion and 20 billion. And the bounds of that color map will not be saved. Um, so, so basically what that means is if you load a color map, the bounds of the data won't be applied to your new variable, um, which is important because the, those two variables that have ranges between zero and one 10 and 20 billion, they have different bounds. And so a transfer function that applies between 0 and 1 has no meaningful value for another variable that ranges between 10 and 20 billion. So I hope that makes sense. There is a difference between saving color map and saving the transfer function. And that difference is the data bounds that we see right here that you can, you can manipulate. Again, saving the transfer function will take these values into account. Uh, loading transfer function, same kind of idea. And then finally, there is histogram scaling. You can do a linear scale, which is what we have by default. Um, if you have, sometimes it's useful to have a logarithmic scale. Um, if you have, like we saw earlier, I think with that flux variable, there were some values on the far right, but we couldn't see them. There weren't enough values to constitute one pixel of the histogram. So a logarithmic scale would have shown those values in the histogram better. And then finally, there is a binary or Boolean scaling just whether or not there is a value, yes or no. So that's the basics of the transfer function. Um, the transfer function works in basically the same way for all the renderers. So what we just went through with the transfer function applies throughout Vapor to all the renderers. Uh, it's the heart of Vapor. It's the one thing you'll be dealing with the most. So that's how you do that. Moving on, we have the Geometry tab, which uh, controls the region that you're interested in. Uh, we can see the coordinates. I have an X uh, value selector and a Y value selector, and here's the range, our minimum and maximum. I can drag these sliders 
And if I have a region of interest um, that I know off the top of my head, I can type those values in, say like, I don't know, 25,000. I can adjust things that way, or I can adjust the region of interest through the sliders. And this will save the data that's loaded into cache. So if you're running out of memory, if you have too much data loaded into your cache, you can reduce the region of interest through the geometry renderer, and that will uh, free up some cache space. You can also copy regions from other renderers. So like, let's say I have another render. I'll create another 2D data, data render by clicking New, 2D Data. And that will add a new renderer to my table of renderers over here. Um, by clicking on these renderers, I get the different settings for those renderers. So you can see in my new 2D data renderer, I have a geometry that extends completely uh, through the extents of my X and Y coordinates. I'll just turn it on for example's sake. And we can see we have some uh, an artifact here called Z fighting. We have two renderers being uh, drawn at the exact same plane. And so um, the computer can't tell which one is in front of the other. But um, just for example's sake, I'll go to my first renderer and I can select a, uh, another renderer. Uh, this is the newly created renderer. Copy its region, and you can see, I'll turn off the second one, my extents have been restored to the full extents or whatever that secondary renderer was. The last thing in the geometry renderer are these controls down here. These let you um, manipulate uh, your renderer in terms of scale. Uh, you can translate the renderer. So let's see, I'll, I'll scale my x-axis by 2. Whoops. So I'm, I'm selecting the wrong renderer right now. You can see up here I'm on the disabled renderer, that second one that I created. I'll go ahead and delete it. And now I have my first renderer. I'll scale x by 2. I'll scale y by 2. And I don't know, you can do whatever you like. If, if you don't think your mountains are sticking up high enough uh, with the height offset, you can multiply your z-axis by 100. That's one way to do it. And you can really see the exaggeration of the height variable that way. You can translate, so let's see, I'm gonna guess, let's translate x by a million. Where is that, 100,000? Let's do a million. Okay, and we've, we've shifted x, same thing with y. And I think you get the idea. Rotation, as you imagine, you can rotate on uh, any axis, x, y, and z, so I'll rotate x by 45. And you might be wondering why this is useful. And the use case for doing all this is that basically Vapor 3 allows you to load multiple data sets into Vapor at the same time. And what users may want to do is, uh, for example, load an atmospheric data set and an ocean data set and make visualizations of how these two simulations uh, correspond to each other. And by scaling, translating, and rotating the two, your renderers that are derived from these two different data sets, you can uh, have more precision in their alignment. So that's basically the, uh, the use case for um, this uh, geometry manipulation tool down here. Uh, lastly, there is the annotation tab, which just lets you turn on a color bar by clicking that checkbox. You can adjust the position through these sliders. You can adjust the size through these sliders. Decimal precision, font size, number of ticks, and then the background color. But uh, it's all pretty uh, basic stuff. Um, I think that wraps up our four tabs. So we went through the variables tab, selected different variables, uh, applied a height variable, uh, went through the data fidelity, which only applies to BDC data. If you directly import your data, like we talked about at the start, uh, directly importing WRF, uh, CF compliant, that's CDF or impasse, you will not have a data fidelity controller, so your renderings might not be uh, real-time responsive uh, if you have very, very large data or very underpowered uh, computer hardware. Um, we went through the appearance tab as well, went through the transfer function. Um, let's see, uh, it doesn't look very, uh, we're using the Boolean, go back to linear. So there's our histogram showing the distribution of our variable and the colors that are being applied to those values and the opacity through the opacity uh, control points, geometry control in the region, and then finally our annotation renderer, which is kind of lazily placed. 
in our rendering, but this is just a demo. We're not making real visualizations yet. We'll get to that in another video. Okay, so I will link to uh, videos below, and uh, from there, if there's a specific renderer you guys would like to see uh, in action, you can click on that link and watch the video uh, pertaining to that renderer. All right, thanks.